I don't know, it's a pretty miraculous thing to, to be existing here in the middle of the ocean. I think what's special about the island landscape is that it's born of elements that we can still see. This is the beginning of the making of islands. And the popping up of only the vegetation that's able to sustain itself in this kind of landscape. And that's the ohia. And all of the ohia's very close relatives. In tropical environments, it's unusual to have a single native species be as dominant on the landscape as, as ohia is. It plays a critical role in the ecosystem. and it, it really anchors the forest, hands down. It is, it is the keystone species uh, throughout Hawaii. Ohia was used in musical instruments. It was used in tools of farmers. It was used in weapons of warfare. In addition to uh, its ecological importance as the main nectar food source for our native Hawaiian birds, a thousand different insects, no doubt. You know, it's found from sea level to 8,000 feet, growing in a lot of different kinds of habitats. You go into an ohia forest and it's Hawaii. Here in Hawaii, it's a unique thing. For any culture, the land that that culture is from shapes the nature of the culture itself. And so for the Hawaiians, the, the huge amount of uniqueness that we have here in Hawaii has affected the way that Hawaiians think, the things that we do, down to our crafts, down to our language. Right by the people. And ohia being such a dominant tree in the landscape, especially before, has affected the way Hawaiians view the world. We lived off the land. We lived, we lived off the land. This was our high rise. These mountains were our high rises. You know, you walk the same path so many times that you remember this tree and you remember that tree and you, you, know, you remember the smells. So much of my childhood was spread out from being in this forest, in this thick fog, to being in crystal clear waters off the shoreline. And you really, really get a grasp of how everything, especially on this beautiful island, Hawaii, is that everything leans on each other. Where, where I live, it's like all these trees are two to three hundred years old. And I think that is too special to, to let go. Um, and it takes too long to, to grow like this. And it never, you know, if, if, if these forests go away, they're never coming back the same way. So I think we really have to protect what we have. It's all aspects of Hawaiian culture. If we, if we don't hold on to that and continue that and share that with our students and share that with the next generation, it could be lost, and at one point in time in our history, Hawaiian culture was on the brink of being lost. I kind of equate that to what's going on with rapid ohia death. Um, Hawaii, we have a history of environmental battles as any place does. And a lot, okay, this is the sort of an epicenter of disease here. So all these trees have died in the past couple of years. And I called and I was like, you know, something's wrong with my trees. Right next door to me is the steam vent inn. That whole forest there is dead. The forest along Leilani Estates, that whole highway and that whole area through there, it's pretty much 95%, like my forest is. 
So it's been really rough. And like, just be like, wow, I built my house to look at my beautiful forest and now it's dead. Okay, so I lived there in the middle of the forest. And then you, you see a new phenomenon that you've never seen for forever, for your whole life. The, the, the dying of the tree. This sudden, uh, you know, epidemic of it has been really severe. Playing out an average mortality rate of 10% per year, you're not going to have very many trees at all after, say, about 10 years' time. So that mortality rate is, is quite high. So there's some, there's some, but if you look over here, you see that crown, the tree with the, the brown leaves there? And then this guy with the brown leaves here. So this is all what we're talking about, ceratocystis disinfection, Rapidohia death. We gave it the name Rapidohia death because a lot of the other diseases are pretty slow acting. This, people are telling us the tree went from healthy to yellow to brown in like two weeks, two weeks, and two weeks later it's losing its leaves. So when we cut into it, there we go, first chop. See that black? black staining coming in there? It didn't take long once we got into the wood of dead trees to figure out that a fungus was killing it. I knew we were up against something um, that could be pretty devastating. So it was very important to work as hard and fast as possible to really figure out what it was, what it's doing, and how we can control it. So you don't see anything on the bark. The fungus isn't on the bark. The fungus is in the sapwood. Now, one critical thing is, of course, a tree is gonna be infected for some time before you see symptoms. So these trees could have infections and we just don't see them yet. So once the fungus gets in, um, it gets in again through this wound. It starts to colonize the sapwood. It starts cutting off the water supply. A lot's happening, but we don't see it. And you know, I, so I've just been kind of in the, uh, what can I do? I'm a teacher, but at the same time, like, I, I mean, this is my passion, my, is forestry. And if we don't have the ohia trees, it's a devastation to our forests, to our people, to the bird life, to the insect life, to the whole water table, you know, everything around us. The catch is today with all our invasive species, most of these forests, the invasive species is gonna come in. So with the one-two punch of the disease and then the weeds, that'll take out the forest. So those forests aren't gonna be able to bounce back. And so it makes me just rethink things in my life. Like, is my son gonna be able to see an Ohia forest when he's my age? Are these trees gonna be here? Well, I sure hope so. I'm gonna do whatever I can to make sure that happens. A disease that's out in the forest, you're not gonna, not gonna cure it, you're not gonna get rid of it, it's not gonna be gone. What I hope that we can do is manage it to restore some areas that are hit by it, to make it so it doesn't spread to new areas. That's what we're focusing on. Well, welcome to the USDA Agricultural Research Service here in Hilo, Hawaii, where we study biology, detection, and try to figure out some management techniques for the ceratocystis fungi killing ohia. So once we got the wood samples, now we want to detect the fungus in the wood to make sure that they have died because of rapid ohia death. One of the commonly used microbiological methods is carrot bathing. You can see this black fungal material. That's actually the ceratocystis fungi. You can see the fruiting bodies of the fungus, known as parathesia. But a major advancement from that microbiology side was a molecular technique that we developed. And instead of having to wait about a month to figure out if ceratocystis is there or not, 
Now within the day of receiving samples, we can actually tell you if ceratocystis is present in, in the wood. And all this area here is colonized by the fungus, and when it's colonized, the tree's not able to uptake water. So that's what's essentially killing the tree. You're getting kind of the same result as drought stress. Species A is much more aggressive. It basically will enter the water stream of the tree and just get carried all from the top to the bottom of the plant. As opposed to B, where the fungus is kind of spreading from a central point and just kind of radiating outward, kind of our goal is not to just lump these together. We want to really clarify these minute differences between the two so that we can kind of develop management strategies that can kind of target those differences. Now on a bigger scale, we're trying to figure out how does the host respond as a large population. You can go into an area where you see widespread mortality in the field. 99% of the trees are dead, but there are still survivors. Is that maybe host resistance that you're looking at? Hopefully the work that, that I do and that we all do here helps to, to kind of prolong the life and the longevity of the Lohia forest. We've made a lot of progress in the past three years now since we identified the pathogen. We're only three years into 100 years worth of research and knowledge that we need to do about this. I mean, we're watching, we're watching very carefully uh, the situation on the island of Hawaii, the spread of rapid ohi death across from Puna and to other places on, on the islands. It was frankly a very pleasant surprise that the, that the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Land and Natural Resources were able to work together so rapidly to create a quarantine. So as soon as we explained to them there's a new fungus outbreak on the Big Island, it could move, if anybody moves anything, Ohia, to other islands, it'll move this to other islands, they said fine. We're gonna put a quarantine. You can't move anything made out of Ohio off the island um, unless it's tested. A lot of logs have been denied the ability to ship. They've said, no, you can't ship that. We found ceratocystis in it, and so they don't move. The same thing for the nursery industry. There's no way of testing a small Ohia seedling without killing it, so they, you can't ship Ohia seedlings. And you can't prove a negative but we know that things that could have spread at the other ends have been stopped because of this quarantine, so I say it's working. When you watch my dancers, although we're here on Oahu, they are not wearing any ohia, and it's sad. It's very sad because we should be. Traditionally and culturally, hula really is an embodiment of our surroundings. And you look at hula movements and what they represent, and it's really people being able to manifest what we see around us. And so who would we be if we didn't take our responsibility to take care of the forest and the things that are around us? But we've made a conscious decision as a halau to find other ways that we can be symbolic to our mele. One really interesting thing that I noticed about Mary Monarch that year was there were a lot of halau who took that route and took a stand um, to make sure they didn't use not just lehua but forest plants in general. We didn't even want to go into the forest to make sure we didn't pick up the fungus or anything, you know, just to be safe. <laughs> We're at the Inaho Gate right now, and we are going to do a quick decon, uh, brush all the mud off of our shoes, and spray down with alcohol to make sure we're not spreading any fungal spores. What you got there, brother? So we're gonna brush down, mud, brush all the mud and debris off of our shoes, and then spray them with alcohol. And we're gonna do that kind of a little bit out of the way so that no one tracks through it. 
Boy Volcanoes National Park receives uh, nearly 2 million visitors per year, making it the premier visitor attraction in the Hawaiian Islands. And that's significant because a lot of people come to Hawaii Volcanoes and then go to other areas in the Hawaiian Islands, areas which may not necessarily be dealing or as aware of the challenges posed by rapid ohia death. This forest is, um, is a wonderful opportunity for our visitors to connect with, with these forests and immerse themselves in these forests. We are intensively sampling trees, suspect trees throughout the park. And, uh, and where we do confirm the disease, we are bringing in scientists and working with our partners and carefully evaluating what management strategy makes the most sense. And that varies by site. It's a challenge because we don't, we don't know, this is such a new disease, we don't fully understand how it spreads. We're still learning about the different methods of spread, but the main hypothesis is that it's spread in beetle frass, ambrosia beetle frass in the wind, and it's deposited on the trees, and if there's a wound on the tree, then the tree may become infected. My name is Curtis Ewing. I'm with the Department of Plant and Environmental Protection Sciences. And here's a gallery. Ambrosia beetles attack um, dead and dying trees preferably, but they will attack healthy trees, especially if there's um, any kind of drought stress or a wound. And if you look at the tree, you can see all this dust right here. This is what the beetles are pushing out as they create galleries. They can actually push out quite a lot of dust over the course of two or three weeks. If they are very active, they can fill this vial with boring dust, actually pack it completely full. The chances that this boring dust are transmitting the disease locally is very, very high. And you can see all the dust is pouring out. Then inside is the uh, xylem. That's where the nitrogen, phosphorus, and water from the roots go up to the leaves. And that's where both the fungus and the beetles are. And that's why we suspect that the beetles are um, an important vector of the disease because they are the only thing that in large numbers is attacking ohia trees and going into this inner part of the tree where the fungus is and kicking out this dust that's full of the spores and also themselves. When they're done, a couple dozen of them will all fly out of here and they'll go and seek a new tree. The Kohala ditch goes out of the back of this valley and out to service the people of Kohala. It's about 7 to 13 million gallons a day. And all that water was recognized years ago as important to the sugar plantations as well as to the farmers in the area and as a source of drinking water and ag water for uh, our citizens. I was on the flight that where we saw it for the first time in early September and all of us on board were mortified. The most recent outbreak in Kohala Mountain is about 30 or 40 miles from the other known location of Rapid Ohia death on the island. So somehow it made that, that jump 30 or 40 miles to Kohala. Maui is the same distance away. So we're really concerned about it getting to Maui and starting another epidemic all over again on their, on their island. The wind is, is, is clearly one, surely one source, one, one probability. We don't know, and that's where the research comes in and trying to understand how it moves. We are doing a lot of sampling to try to, to test that hypothesis that the, the fungus can move by the air. And it's significant because if it can move long distances, it has the potential of jumping to other islands on its own. And so we have developed these two traps to see if we can pick up spores. 
We prepared those slides with scotch tape and uh, vacuum grease on it, which is very sticky, so all kinds of different stuff gets stuck on it by the airstream and, and the trap. We can say for sure that we can detect them locally around infected trees. There's no question about that. It's when we start moving to longer distance dispersal. Uh, uh, for example, we've been operating traps for almost a year at the southern end of the island, and, and so far we've only analyzed about half the samples, but have, don't have any detections down there. But, you know, it's, it's really hard to interpret negative results. There's always that possibility that you're missing something. If this wind movement is a very rare event, or maybe it's not happening at all, maybe it's more a localized movement, it has some big impacts on how we manage for the disease. So it's an important thing to try to figure out. If the Ohia people decide that for some reason they need to go into dormancy, then you need to worry about economy. Some people say that you can break down the word ohia to a root word, ohi. And they'll talk about how the ohia is really important in its function of gathering water for the land, gathering up this rain and this mist. If the ohia people's roots don't break up the landscape. If their bark and the moss that grows on their bark and their fuzzy leaves cannot collect water anymore, where do you think your water is going to come from? The most important product we get out of our forests is water. It is it's certainly true that healthy watersheds save our soil as well. You need something to hold the land back. The ohia, and specifically, without it, you put so much strain on everything else. Then the runoff goes into the ocean, and it suffocates the coral. And it's, it's just a domino effect after that. You really, really have to take care of every part of Hawaii. You can't just focus on one area. Rain is important. Ohia is important to the rain. There's this old Hawaiian saying that everybody likes to quote, no ka the rain follows the forest. And if the ohia is gone, our dominant forest tree, what happens to the rain? If the rain is gone, what happens to us? And that's just a scary, scary thought to think that there is a threat out there that can demolish our way of life here on the island. And I don't want to be known as the generation that lost the ohia. You know, it's that Hawaiian saying, you know, you take care of the aina, the aina takes care of you. I, I, just, I just love Hawaii just because of the outdoors. You know, now I live up in the mountains and spend a lot of time um, out in the, in the woods with my bow. It's been kind of an interesting topic because if you don't live in Ohia Forest and if you, if you don't know anything about the trees, if you don't spend time outdoors hiking, a lot of times people don't consider it very uh, important. We live in the forest, so for me it was quite a scare and so I wanted to learn how to prevent it from spreading, how to prevent it from the areas that have not been affected yet and just kind of educate myself a bit. So the first thing is there's a pathogen. There's two pathogens. They've come in here like one more invasive disease and they started killing a lot of trees. Then secondly, a lot of this is going to be human vectored. It's people moving stuff around. The dead trees are full of fungus, so don't move wood around because you're moving fungus around by that. The fungus needs some sort of wound to get into a tree because it's in the sapwood. 
So don't ding trees or watch a tree if you ding the bark because it's able to get that. The fungus comes out of the tree when the boring beetles get in the trees and everybody's seen boring beetles attacking sick trees. And then that sawdust is full of fungal spores. That sawdust on the ground is full of fungal spores. So if you were in a diseased forest, don't track mud into a clean forest. Clean your shoes, clean your gear off. The fungal spores are sticky, so anything you cut into a tree is gonna get contaminated with. Clean your tools, sterilize your tools. Moving within a locality, it does tend to move by the blowing of the frass of the beetles, but moving in long jumps, it's gonna be people moving it, and if people know not to do that, that can really help. Ulua e kia kua anoho i kona kaho. Allow this inspiration to take root so that it becomes foundational. And um, we're talking about the physical tree and we're talking about the inspiration in here. So this tree and this tree. If we're well, then they'll be well. So be well. Here is a flower bud by tomorrow. See, this is just about to pop. By tomorrow, this will all burst out. You'll see the stamens and the flowers coming out of this. After a few days, the stamens fall off and all that's left is the pistils. Then the pistils will fall off in its green fruit. And this takes several months for the green fruit here to ripen. This is ripe and it's full of seed. So that's how they, they colonize lavas. These tiny little seeds blow and they're, they're by the millions and just one will find a little crack in the lava where it's got a little bit of organic matter and will grow and it will start a new Ohia tree. <laughs>